Welcome to Speaking Opera. My name is Howard Hart, and I'm your host today. I will be joined by our special guest, Bill DePeter. We'll be discussing live opera on disc, A Brief History. This is the third in a three-part conversation. Another personality that we both knew was Ralph Ferrandino. <laughs> and and uh, Ralph had his label, Legendary Recordings. But he had started out selling uh, open reel and cassette tapes. He was known as Mr. Tape. Mm-hmm. He had a vast catalog huge, of tape. Huge. Yeah. And uh, I remember the first time I saw his, his listing, which was very well organized by composer and title and, and uh, many, many unusual things that other people didn't offer. And uh, he was also friendly with singers and, very friendly. and uh, would uh, make a point of releasing uh, performances with Teres Estratus and Grace Bunbury. And he was a great admirer of Lich Albanese and Sam and, Raimi. Yeah. And mm-hmm. yeah, it, the, those were things that were of particular interest to him. And he also had an interest, I think, in, you know, the unusual things, maybe, you know, coronation of Papaya with Gwyneth Jones and John Vickers, which, you know, the early music people wouldn't, wouldn't have approved of, but but it was uh, certainly interesting for admirers of those singers to, to hear them. In, in, Krista Ludwig, yes, Gear Off. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd like to interject for a minute about Ralph Ferrandino. Ralph and I were very good friends, as you know. And we had done a, uh, Ken Harris. Do you remember Ken Harris yes. from JNR? Yeah. We went on, I, I would never give this to anyone. I hope that no one has it. We went on a uh, cable television program together because Virginia Zayani was in for the, uh, there was a gala at in New Jersey and she was singing. And I was very lucky to meet uh Nicola Rossi the many as well. And I had spent some time with them with Ralph. It was lovely. But he adored Lee Chalbanese. And so he said, I have a special favor to ask you. And I, I it was something I didn't know if I'd want to do it, but because I had done a couple of radio pro, uh, interviews, but I thought, eh, I think I'll continue doing this. Um, and so I went to Lee Chalbanese's home, which was amazing, incredible, on Park Avenue. And she was delightful. She made delicious coffee. What is it with Italian sopranos? They make great coffee. Delicious. And she was delightful, really lovely. And we videotaped it. We're trying to actually restore the videotape from the interview. Uh, but he adored her. And he put out that, I think it was, how many, it was a box set of her performances. Well, he, well, he put out a series of uh, discs with her. One yeah. one was focused on Verismo, and one was yeah. Puccini, and you know, one was Bel Canto. So he, he knew her, her catalog so to speak backwards and forwards and, and uh, chose to you know, release a lot of interesting performances with she her. was she was delightful she was very warm I I must say it was a wonderful experience I interviewed her and she was just really uh, very warm very nice and she loved Ralph I mean they were he was her, he was devoted to her he just adored her and Virginia Zayani also uh, and he was a character but I know in his home when he lived near Lincoln Center, um, Grace Bunbury, uh, especially St- Teresa Stratus, uh, any number of people uh, would visit him and get tapes and so forth. So, right. and Sam Raimi was yeah. friends also. Well, I think Stratus was a good example of a singer who didn't make a lot of commercial recordings. So, you know, if you were interested in her artistry, you know, the the only way to experience that was to find the live performance recordings with her. Absolutely. And I think there. Are, the next uh, personality that uh, that comes to mind is Bill Carroll. Who I think you knew personally. Yes, I knew him very well. Yeah, actually. and uh, I, I, he only put out a few releases, but they were really significant. I remember there was the Sonambula from Cologne, and uh, there was the he was the first to put out the really wonderful Trovatore from Salzburg with Lantine Price and Franco Corelli and Siminato and Bastianini conducted by Von Karajan. And that was like one of the legendary performances that uh, was of interest to a lot of different collectors. And his was the first on LP. Bill Carroll, it's interesting. I, I don't know if any of our listeners knew him or not. He was a delightful man. He loved figure skating. He was really into figure skating. I think he did some himself. Uh, and he also wrote about it uh, 
and was a very close friend with Santiago Rodriguez at BJR. And Rod helped him with tapes and with uh, even working on the sound with him. And he died very, very young and unexpectedly. Um, mm. He was probably, I'm only guessing, I was had moved to New York yet or just had. So he was probably in his 30s when he died. He was young. Mm. Yeah. It's unfortunate. And one of the other interesting uh, labels was Voce. Yes. And that was the work of three guys who lived in California, uh, one of whom is one of the authors of the Eddie Smith bi discography, Bill Collins. And then there was a fellow who worked at Tower Records and another fellow who was a big collector. And they focused on the things that were of interest to them. They tended to like look for obscure corners of the repertoire, you know, Mozart operas that hadn't been recorded and mm -hmm. Stefani operas. And, you know, they had some certainly interesting releases. They tended to take a very um, plain uh, presentation. They didn't do a lot of, you know, colorful covers or, or anything like that. It was all black and white, but, but uh, you know, in a very neat orderly fashion they had nice notes and and uh and, and def definitely uh good documentation but they are uh, they chose some interesting things i think bill collins did the notes if i'm not mistaken and bob rose did some of them as well bob rose was the main person or i don't know how that worked it, yeah i mean I, I, and... I mean i knew i knew all three of them and melvin john yeah, yeah. He, he was yeah. the the tower person mm -hmm. and uh Bill Collins was the author, and and Bob was, I, I he, if I remember correctly, was retired. But this was more a hobby that that uh, became a a profession in in a sense, a new career for him because he had I when I visited him, he had the largest LP collection of opera that I had seen up to that point. Even larger than mine when I lived in Brooklyn Heights. Well, it, <laughs> it probably will be as big, but his was all opera. Yours was not. <laughs> We're close. <laughs> I only had 10, 10 versions of the Beethoven symphonies. I right. Read. That was a, I had a pretty substantial oh, version I, that I, I recall that, but I remember seeing Bob. He had a, a, a hallway in his California home, and the hallway from one end to the other was, was shelving for LPs. And, well... <laughs> But it was a hallway that's probably twice as long as my, my wall of CDs You're smiling over there. because I'm looking at a wall of, of a, a massive wall of CDs at Bill's apartment <laughs> in New York. <laughs> right, but as I I'm, I would say, uh, Bob's hallway was probably twice as long as my wall, but and it was all LPs. He, he had a, a really vast collection, and he he had been around in. Uh, since the 78 days, so he was a real collector. Voce had put out, uh, I think, Macbeth and Forza, the original versions, so the, the earlier versions of, of Right, those, and they put out, operas. right, and the French version of Don Carlos, so that, that was another interest of, of theirs, the, and Simon Bocanegro, the, the first version. So these were, you know, like I said, uh, more or less obscure corners of the repertoire. I mean, they did a few, um, more well-known works like Lucrezia Borgia with Caballé, but you wouldn't look for La Boheme or Tosca on their label because that wasn't what really what they wanted to do. Actually, one of my closest friends is on two of the recordings, Dana Fortunato, mm -hmm. and uh, it was Newell Jenkins, who was a wonderful fellow who put together any number of uh, operas that were rarely or ever done. Stefani, what was the name of the Stefani opera? Now I can't oh, remember. La Libertà Contenta. Right. Yes. And there was a Vivaldi opera, Il Fantonacci, which I think was the first recording of that, if I'm not mistaken. I know some other recordings followed it. Yeah, but, very likely. Yeah. The Vivaldi revival came somewhat later. To our listeners, because I'm in New York, I'm not going to edit out any of the street noise <laughs> to give it more atmosphere, <laughs> including <laughs> alarms and so forth. Well, it's one of, one of the characteristics of, of being a city dweller is that you, you have that noise all around you, but uh, we, we have kind of learned to tune it out. <laughs> Except when Caballé is singing her piano shimos. <laughs> exactly, or, or played the, the final scene of Goethe and Amarok, and then we're all set. <laughs> right. So, Bill, there's a series on Voce of uh, 
Verdi, a Verdi series of performances that were the first or the earlier versions? How, how was that? That's was that correct. Everything? Yes. Uh, there were, if I recall correctly, four. And those included the original versions of uh, Macbeth, uh, La Forza del Destino, Simen Bocanegra, and then the first recording of Verdi's Don Carlo in French, Don Carlos. So that was a particular interest for the people at Boche. They, they were, as I, we had mentioned previously, that they tried to explore you know, the less well-known corners of the repertoire, and this was something that you know, collectors were certainly interested in because we only tend to hear the revised versions of these operas. And uh, this was a, a, a real breakthrough for them in, in terms of bringing this to the public. Now, some uh, other labels that uh, come to mind were, uh, I'm, I'm thinking now of the, the European labels. There was Melodrame, which was um, the work of uh, a soprano named Ina del Campo. She did sing at the Met and uh, in some of the European houses. And she undertook to you know, start releasing uh, a fairly substantial catalog. They at one point had Oh, but just about everything from Bayreuth for for uh, the, f the first 10 years after they reopened after the war. Um, and uh, she, I, I believe, was friendly with some of the singers as well in, in her own history. I remember her singing a duet from Tosca with Ed Rosen when, when we visited her in Milan. So she was a, a bit of a personality. Um, one major personality for um, the Italians was a, a Greek named Nikos Velisiotis, and he was the mastermind of a, a, any number of labels. Um, I think of Arcadia and Hunt, and also the Fonicetra line. And Nikos was, a, a <laughs> if, you, if I may say so, a bit of a wheeler dealer, and uh, he would, you know, and uh, well, I don't want to cast aspersions, but he was not above some fakery. There's a, a notorious recording of uh, part of Turandot, uh, ostensibly from the Teatro Colon in Buenos Aires with Maria Callas. And it seems that that has been pretty much disproven at, at it, that it's a fake. But it was pretty controversial when it first came out, and not everyone agreed what, whether it was real or not. But uh, he supposedly had concocted this out of various recordings to create something that, that wasn't uh, authentic. Selitsky, he has an article about the uh, this... Or, oh, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't him. It was uh, Milan Petkovic. Um, who was also associated, associated to some degree with the Divina label. Mm -hmm. And he did all the research, and there was oscilloscope testing. And, and uh, t in his opinion, it's a concoction of Collis's early studio recording of the aria in Questa Regia, mm -hmm. um, part of her complete recording, and then the Decca recording with Mario del Monaco. And then they interpolated a high C for Delmonico, um, which it's claimed Delmonico didn't sing at those performances. He, he never did the high C. So the whole thing seems to be pretty much fraudulent, but uh, Nikos was not above this, but he but he was an interesting personality and he, he also loved music. He was very much, uh, you know, an enthusiast and, uh, and uh, want, wanted to, uh, you know, to bring a lot of this stuff to the public, whether real or not, but uh, that was the the perhaps most significant um, fraud that might one might say that I'm aware of that he was associated with. Mm -hmm. um, another label was Mito, and that was um, I guess either German or Austrian fellow Hans Peter Ebner, and uh, he he was associated with Nikos for a while. And then went off on his own and started his own label. A lot of very interesting stuff. He did pretty high quality work, I think. He he managed to uh, get better sound than a lot of others had done. So his, his stuff was that was the Mito. Yeah, Mito. very much worthwhile. 
and those are the Europeans that I, I can think of. There were a couple of others. I, I, I have to admit, I don't always remember the names. There was a label in England, e e Eclipse, and then he, they also used the Valhall label, not to be confused with the current or more recent Valhall. But that was a, a British fellow, and uh, he had put out, I remember, a number of uh, Covent Garden performances, Charlie after with Julie and Aida with Cornelia and Julie. Some of those performances were the first on CD from him. He was uh, another in that group. And then uh, if we spread uh, our uh, geography a little bit more, there was um, a South American singer, Adelaida Negri, and she sang at the Met as well. And she began her own label, Ornamenti. And initially, it was a, a variety of performances, but ultimately ended up being a, a vanity label. She released you know, a really big catalog of her own performances. So she was out there too. And, and uh, so a few things about her label didn't always pan out. I remember she put out a recording of Don Carlo with Caballé from the Orange Festival. And left out a huge chunk of the performance, but added some kind of addenda to fill out the rest. <laughs> so you kind of wonder, well, why did they leave out, you know, a, a big piece of the performance just to leave room for something that didn't uh, belong there? But but she was uh, another one. Um, the other labels from Europe that I think of are um, Gala and Bella Voce. They were from the Netherlands. There was Verona also, I think, an, uh, an aria, uh, a label from the Netherlands. Um, it was Ponto, Exclusive, um, GOP. So we had a, a lot of competition when I was in the business. And uh, those were the, the major ones I think of. Oh, there was a story, I, it just came to mind with um, Santiago Rodriguez with BJR. Remember, we were talking about. You know things that uh, we recall about them, and, and it's a wonderful story that he used to tell when he was recording um, a performance in in Carnegie Hall, and he was sitting very near the front, and one of his loves was Montserrat Caballé, <coughs> and he was recording on a cassette tape recorder, and Caballé came to the end of one of her great shanas, and the audience was applauding wildly. And he figured that that was a good point for him to turn the, the tape over, as we know that you record it on one side of the cassette, and then you turn it over and record it on the other side. And he was having some trouble getting the tape back into the recorder and getting it going again. She looked down and saw him fumbling around. So in order to give him more time, she sort of blowing kisses to the audience and bowing some more so that the applause would continue and, and uh, Rod would have enough time to get the tape going. That was the story that he told, so I'm I'm not making it up, but uh, a, a, f a fun recollection of uh, one of the the personalities in that. I I wanted to add one uh, small label uh, when I was at German News years ago um, in the I guess late seventies. Um, there was Michael Polamani who did MDP, and at that time, the for instance, the Gili Cornelia Traviata wasn't available. So he he put out a number of things that were of interest to people. Uh, he did do the Armida with Collis. Unfortunately, he did that. Remember that he uh, interpolated somebody else's performance in right. the Christina Doidekam, and, yes, and right. you could hear right away it was her. Right. You know, well, as we know, there were, there was for many years a section that was simply missing. Um, more recently, there was a tape that turned up with the whole thing, but the part that was missing was severely compromised. So uh, his solution instead was to uh, in, you know, interpolate from another performance to just uh, keep the continuity of the music. Unfortunately, when that, when that was reviewed, people picked up on it. Um, he was a very nice man. Uh, I remember he used to come and deliver his recordings, and he, there were, he had some interesting things. That yeah, was, he, that was the only recording we had that we had problems with. Most, of, a lot of the the items he put out were really of interest. To people. Yeah, I think his main interest was the earlier era. It was, was you know nineteen forties, nineteen fifties, 
I remember there was uh, Traviata with Lina Pagliugi and, as you mentioned, the uh, the Covent Garden performances. And he really was a friend with Rosa Poncel. Yeah. Um, he had brought some various things to show me, photographs of them together, and right. Villa Pace and all of that. He was very, actually a very nice fellow and loved what he did. And he put out, he never did CDs, but he did the LPs. Right. So oh. MDP. Was yep. Now the, I think we had alluded earlier to uh, how there was a transition from these small independent labels putting out these live performances. And I think the major labels ended up sort of getting on board, one might say. And in, more recently, it, it's not uncommon for DG or, or uh, you know, or Decca or Phillips to record a performance live for re release on CD. And a number of the opera houses in, in Europe and the Metropolitan Opera, which was for so long opposed to the release of their broadcast performances, have sort of gotten on the bandwagon and now either release them themselves or they cooperate with other labels to you know, get these things out because there's enough interest and, in, you know, having these performances recorded in performance is um, a cost saver. They don't have to uh, hire orchestras and rehearse them in a studio setting, which is prohibitively expensive. So we do have a, a, a any number of uh, live labels associated with the opera houses and they authorize their releases. One of the early ones was Mondo Musica, they released a whole series of performances from La Fenice in Venice. There was um, the Royal Opera House in Cov at Covent Garden in London. They had their own label. Um, the Glyndebourne Festival has a label. Uh, there was a very brief uh, period when the Rome Opera had, had released a few things. Unfortunately, they didn't seem to, to go very far with that. Um, the Met has um, released their own performances and they've released uh, others through uh, on the Sony label uh, a whole series of broadcasts the Vienna Staatsoper has had their performances released um, any number of labels I think one of the early ones that comes to mind is um, Die Frau Neschatten which was recorded in performance a, a historic cast with Birgit Nielsen as the Dyer's wife and Riesenek and Karl Böhm conducting and they recorded that and then released it on CD. They later did a series of Karian performances, operas that he hadn't recorded. Also another performance of Frau Schatten and Pizzetti's Murder in the Cathedral, uh, Tannhäuser. So those were operas that Karian hadn't gotten around to recording but they managed to get the live ones out. And then RCA did a series. Um, some apparently recorded for release and others from an earlier period. And finally, the Orfeo label, which has released almost 50 performances from Vienna of you know, fairly significant output. The uh, Hardy label in Italy have, has released performances from the Teatro San Carlo in Naples and the Teatro Reggio in Parma. Uh, yeah, again, these are historic performances. Opera Australia has released uh, another series from the Opera House in Sydney, quite a few with Joan Sutherland, one of my favorites. And Testament, they've done performances from all over, a lot from Covent Garden. And then we have the Dynamic label in Italy, which has released performances from various opera houses all over Italy. A lot of uh, unusual repertoire and, and uh, some standard works with you know, younger singers who maybe are not uh, on the radar of the, the major labels. So that's of a, you know, certainly of interest as well. Or major sopranos that are on the radar, <laughs> you know. I'm speaking of. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, well, yeah. it, it's it's it can be a lot of fun to see a singer that Absolutely. you 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 have right. discovered, so, was, so to speak. <laughs> I was speaking of Anna Perazzi, who made her Met debut as uh, Lady Macbeth 
Just, right. She was incredible, yeah. just incredible. And she's singing all over Europe, but it's particularly in Italy yeah. with two uh, great reviews. And she's a, I, one of my favorites today. She's amazing. Yeah, and the, there was a Very recording of, of Il Trovatore with her on the Dynamic label. And with any luck, we'll, we'll be getting some more. And one of the interesting uh, venues for live performance recordings, which we, we mentioned previously, is the Bayreuth Festival, which of course does the works of Wagner. And recordings were made by the commercial labels starting as soon as the festival began again after the war. And we have, you know, from the early festivals, there's um, Lohengrin with Eleanor Stieber and Wolfgang Windegassen, and we know that uh, a complete ring was recorded very early on, and ultimately that they decided against releasing it. But then uh, later on, there was a, another cycle with uh, Karl Bert conducting, and that was released on Testament, and you know, a number of other performances I think, of the Flying Dutchman with Astrid Varney and um, other. Tristan with Nielsen, and then there was the the ring with Carl Boehm from the '60s. So, there, that's been a, an important source. Where in in that particular case, uh, the commercial labels wanted to be able to release these Wagner performances, but perhaps you know recording them in the studio was you know too expensive. So this was an alternative for them to go into the, the Bayreuth Opera House with their cooperation and record live performances. So even early on, we can see that while the independent um, producers were doing their thing, the commercial labels saw the potential of these live performances as a, as a way to uh, you know, offer recordings. So because I'm not a too much of a traditionalist. I think we'll do this a little differently than I normally do interviews, which is I'd like to ask you now, how did you get into all of this? How did it all begin at the beginning? <laughs> and you go first. Okay? All right. All right. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So for me, uh, this, all, this journey started in 1973. Um, I was a junior in high school and one of the teachers in my school would get score desks tickets for the Metropolitan Opera. Those were seats that don't have a view of the stage. They were meant for students so that the student could sit and follow the score. They wouldn't be able to see the performance, but they could hear it and follow the music. And he would offer those to the students in my school. And we were reading Shakespeare's Macbeth at the same time that the Metropolitan Opera was performing Verdi's Macbeth. And that kind of caught my interest. I said, well, that would be interesting. I've never been to the opera. Let me go and see Macbeth. So I went and spoke to him and he said, oh, I'm really sorry, but you know, all the tickets I had for Macbeth are sold. But he said, but there's another way you can get in. He said, they sell what they called at the time student rush tickets. So I think if my recollection is correct, it was $8, which was a lot of money for me at that point, but you know, not outrageous. And uh, I sat in the orchestra and I saw Macbeth with Cheryl Milnes and Eleanor Ross. And I was really impressed. Though I, I wasn't really committed to it, but I thought, well, this is this was interesting. And I was bowled over by the, the, the sound of these wonderful voices s filling the house and soaring out over the orchestra, which I had never experienced before. So it was enough for me to say, well, I, I wanna try something else. And then I went to hear Carmen with Marilyn Horn. And for me, that's like the rest is history. Yeah, that was, that, after that, I was hooked. So I, I went for you know, a few times while I was still in high school. When I got to college, I dove in deep. I remember going to the Ring of the Nibelungen in 1975 and waiting on the standing room line to see the, the the complete ring with Birgit Nielsen as Brunhilde, and there I made friends with people I know to this day, Gary Jasko, who we mentioned earlier, being one of them, and after that I started to go with standing room just about every week for four or five performances, sometimes every week. So that was my 
real introduction. I, I, that's how I became familiar with many of these works. And then I started to buy recordings. That's how I, I met, I mentioned earlier, met, or I, meant, I will mention this, that I, you know, I met, met Ed Rosen, who I later worked for, and you know, became more and more interested. And after a few years, when I knew Ed, he, he offered me a job, and I f thought, well, okay, this is something I could I could uh, do very well in, and that I went to work for him for the first time in 1980. So you know, after I guess what six seven years of opera attendance, that I was already ready and, and willing to take the plunge and become uh, you know someone who worked in that field. So that that was for me the my path to uh, to the live performance. Recording in, um, industry, and you continue going to opera. I do, and then I continue collecting and you know sharing with uh, fellow opera lovers in, in whatever way I can. And I've sp spoken f to your opera group a couple of times. Yes, it's yes, been great yeah, fun. I always tell them it's very easy to talk about something you love. So <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. R Lucia Pop once said to me, and it's on a, one of the on the video, one of the audio uh, interviews. She said, "If you don't love doing something, you shouldn't do it." Mm -hmm. I love that. I always I can hear her voice saying that. Right. You must have joy mm -hmm. in, in what you do. And what are you doing now? Now I'm in records management. Mm -hmm. um, so it, in a way, it kind of followed. You know, being uh, someone who coordinated, you know, all the the various aspects of. Uh, of record production and then CDs, you, you do develop a, a, a good attention to detail and that that kind of segued into records management. So that, uh, you know, one followed the other and, uh, you know, I'm, I d didn't look back because, uh, you know, as we discussed uh, how, you know, the industry changed and, uh, you know, the CD, live CDs are, are uh, you know, done in a very different way and distributed in a very different way. So, so much is downloaded now. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Interesting. So I was a little boy in Malden, Mass. I was five years old. My father was in the Merchant Marine, and I was there with my mother and my two sisters. And I discovered these round things that were made out of shellac called seventy-eight RPMs or whatever. <laughs> And they had this this person called Enrico Caruso. I still remember. I was I played the the seventy eights, and I was totally in love with opera. I don't even remember not ever loving not loving opera. I always loved opera, and my grandfather loved it. And he was an amateur photographer, an amateur uh, violinist, but he was a professional photographer. He did. Uh, took photos and made postcards for the Freedom Trail in Boston. And he really encouraged me uh, to, to play the 78s. He let me, I brought them down, played them, and he loved listening with me. And so that actually went right through high school. I went to visit him and we'd play 78s even when LPs came in. And my grandmother on the other side of my, on my mother's, that was my father's father. My mother's mother loved Milton Cross and the opera. So, and I spent a lot of time with her in North Reading. And so I got fed from both my grandparents, and that's how I fell in love with opera. My grandfather had known a little bit, um, Geraldine Farrar, who lived one town over uh, from Malden in, in Melrose, where she was born. And he always encouraged me to go to the opera. And then I remember in 1963, my French teacher took a group of us to my very first opera. And I, I must say, I was already hooked in a big way and I had started, you know, I'd saved my lunch money to buy records on the side and all that kind of thing. But at 1963, I went to hear Traviata with a Met on tour with Anna Maffo, Richard Tucker and Mario Sereni. And I was like, then I, I was always hooked, but then I was really hooked. And I had uh, teachers throughout high school, uh, including my music appreciation teacher, who really encouraged me to think about teaching music or teaching music history, that kind of thing. But, you know, as it was, I, I was young. I was 18. I moved into Boston. I worked in a record store. Uh, and so that's how it, my history went into working in record stores in Harvard Square. And then I moved to New York. And the one thing that happened when I moved to New York at 30, everything I had always planned on happened. 
and it was a, a period of my life that I could never have dreamt on. Really, in my wildest dreams, I never dreamt I would live that life. Um, I went to the opera three to five times a week. Doesn't that ring a bell? Sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went, started going to the Met all the time, and I got to know some of the singers. And I would be remiss in not mentioning one of my beloved friends of all time, Erica Davidson, who did photography for the Met but was independent. And uh, she was a very dear friend who I love very much. Uh, and I'll be posting on our website, Speaking of Opera Summer for Photographs, that she gave me personally uh, of different opera singers and so forth. So it, it, it was my journey. And uh, like you, I worked for German News first, and I became an independent rep. And I worked for various people, International Book and Record. I worked for Kochwa. But I always was, at that time, I was an independent rep, so I wasn't working directly with them, but I was selling their product, but I wasn't uh, salaried by them. And so when the record business went um, kaput, which it did when, with uh, Napster and all of that, um, I went back to school and I was, you were very supportive as a friend. I, I went back to school and got a, um, gained a credential in chemical dependency counseling and ended up eventually being a director of an outpatient department. But my journey in opera never changed. I was always at the opera. Um, I went to almost, I don't know how many, but I calculated when it was hundreds of performances of Renata Scotto because I went to everything all the time. And I want to thank uh, Bob Lombardo, who was their manager. I was able, to, I bought a lot of tickets, but whenever tickets were not available because it was sold out, like in the Tritico and the Mental Lesco, I Bob was very helpful and very kind to me and I would get passes and I never forgotten that. He was a one, he's a wonderful man. He's, I saw him a few years ago and uh, he was very kind to me, as was Renata Scotto. She's a, a wonderful human being. Right, uh, but I'll, I'll interject and, and yeah. uh, mention that our paths crossed because of our involvement with the industry. I worked for Ed Rosen producing the records. You worked for a distributor who was distributing the records and that's how we met. That's very important. That's it. that's how we're here today doing this. So right. I'm probably going on too long, but I just it's there are so many memories that yep. uh, you know we love the singers. I I remember when I first met. It's before I mentioned it, I think, when I moved to New York. I stood through two Frau and a Schatten's big problem, right? Leonie Riesnick, James King, was yep. Shredder Fine, and, yep. and uh, I, I, Berm conducting. I'd never heard uh, Berm conduct live before, and I thought this is where I belong. And I do want to mention, um, we're going to leave, no matter how many people we mention, we're going to leave somebody out and I'm going to feel like I should have said something. So the podcast is, will continue. I plan, hopefully we'll do, be doing this, uh, the podcast every two weeks, uh, starting actually in the middle of this month. Right. But, uh, but I'll, I'll add another personal story. Please. Um, one of the first times that I traveled for opera, I'm, I wasn't the very first, mm -hmm. but I remember that the Chicago Opera was doing Lucia de Lammermoor with Joan Sutherland, one of my first loves, mm -hmm. and Luciano Pavarotti. And I thought, 1975, this, I thought, this is probably the only opportunity I'll ever have to hear Joan Sutherland sing this opera. Lo and behold, she continued to sing it for quite a few more years, but at the time I didn't expect that was gonna happen. So I said, I'm gonna make sure that I get out there. I remember writing to the Chicago Opera. I sent them a blank check I said, I'll buy any ticket for any performance. And lo and behold, like two, two weeks later, I got the letter in the mail. I was ecstatic. But I, being a poor student at the time, uh, I couldn't afford to stay in Chicago. I could afford the airfare, but I couldn't afford the hotel. So I flew to Chicago the day of the performance, went to the opera house, saw Lucia de Lammermoor, and then went right back to the airport and stayed overnight in the airport and caught the flight back the next morning. <laughs> that was devotion. That is I don't devotion. know if I can do it now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, it's, we think of people lining up years with standing room and people waiting outside. And, you know, it's, it, this is, it, opera is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yes. It really is. And, and I was just to, um, kind of cap what I was saying. I, when I left um, counseling and, and the work that I did, uh, that was all in New York City. I, I although I loved it uh, as an experience, I, it was never a connection that I had in the way I, I did with opera ever. And uh, I did want to mention Tim Page, who's very important to me, and Maria Schanzer, who 
encouraged me to do the early interviews that you were around. You were with me when I interviewed Lucia Pop. Right. Uh, and I, I, when I stopped doing them, uh, in fact, Ellen Esteba said to him, you should keep doing these. And I didn't. It was in the 80s. Um, life just, there was a lot going on. And um, I'm revisiting that now. Um, mm-hmm. I'm working on my Italian, which isn't terrific uh, to be able to tune up that and maybe go into some other directions with the interviewing. But this is um, the journey never changed. It mm-hmm. just the chapters were different. And yeah. now I'm back doing what I really, really love. Mm-hmm. I was thinking when you were talking about the the Chicago, how when we love something, we keep doing it. And it, it, it's wonderful. And I um, I love very much the um, early singers, the 70, you know, period singers from the 78 era. I have so many, many singers that I loved at the Met. I can't even start to think of how many that were just wonderful and some that were whatever, you know, but, but it was at the Met and it was an experience. But I, I also find that um, doing this, it's opening a new door for many new singers. And, and um, mm-hmm. I, I won't get into this it's for another time, but the Boston Early Music Festival has so much incredible singing. And there are so many other, there are so many periods of opera and so many things that one can experience that are yeah. wonderful, wonderful. Another aspect of, of my love of opera is the way that it opens doors to other parts of our culture too, whether it's painting or literature or architecture. And I remember our trip in 2005 to Italy, your wow. first time in Italy. And how wonderful it was to share that with you. And as part of that journey, we went to the opera in Rome and Parma. And uh, that that was a, a wonderful part of that. It, it, it was my first time that I went to Italy. And I'm, you know, I'm, I love things Italian. I, I um, when we were in, especially, well, both Rome and Parma, I thought of all the singers that had sung there. And I enjoyed the performances, both cases, but... I, it was also the whole history of it. It was amazing. And I must say, perhaps from my own history, when I go to the Met, I, I there's a feeling I'm at home. When I sit in the Met, I feel like I'm at home. And Boston has had a, a, a they've moved around a lot. And, and, you know, I went to a lot of Sarah Caldwell's performances, which many of them were wonderful. Um, but they, they haven't had a real opera house since they tore the one down, which they really didn't need to, yeah. uh, in, uh, in near Northeastern. Uh, but they do, there was this good opera everywhere. In fact, we're going to one very soon, which I'm excited about. Can right. I mention? Oh, right. <laughs> so, you know, every one should always have new and favorite singers that are around. And I have a number of them. But one of them is a tenor by the name of Santiago Ballerini, who I had heard uh, with you a few years ago uh, with Angela Mead. Right, and in, it, it was incredible. And, yeah, and it was in uh, Il Pirata. Right. And he was incredible. He got an enormous ovation. I mean, there were some tapes around with it and one can get. But he, he, he was, I really didn't know who he was. And he sang unbelievably beautifully beautiful beautiful voice and incredible agility and good high notes Mm -hmm. so when we went this summer it's a cute story so i think i'm going to tell it we went to uh fille du regiment and uh the soprano was very good uh uh and i enjoyed the overall production but when he came out he stole the show and he did the cartwheel when he came out i went what is this (laughs) he's in very good shape but he sang the big aria, yeah, yes. you know, which everyone knows from Pavarotti and, and so forth, or whoever's singing it. But he got all the, he nailed all those nine high C's and he was incredible. And he got yeah. enormous ovation. He's fabulous. Yeah. So I'm, and I'm a very big fan. I think he's a wonderful musician. Yeah, so uh, I know we're looking forward to Barbieri di Sevilla in Toronto. With For two reasons. Because of the conducting also. Oh, right. Yes. Which will be very interesting. Yes. Speranza Scabucci. And that'll be the first time I think we both heard her. Yes. Yeah, she's been getting very good reviews, and I have recordings of hers on mm-hmm. CDR. Yeah. Um, she's amazing. Right. She's really something. Yeah. So I think that we should have, um, we have to bring the curtain down today. Mm-hmm. So it's been fun doing this. And I, I would like to say to the people who are listening to this, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, Bill's a good friend. And, uh, the love of opera is something that's very special. And I've been very fortunate and blessed in my life, and now in my eighth decade, 
to have had so many wonderful people love his, I mean, for me, the opera has created such loving relationships with people and wonderful experiences. Yes. Sometimes it doesn't have to be the greatest performance, but the beauty of the music and the experience and sharing it, especially in live performance, but in recordings as well, yeah. is very special. Definitely. I want to thank you for doing this, Bill. It's really been fun. And thank you for your expertise. And you have amazing knowledge in all of this uh, material. Well, I, as I sound like a broken record, but I keep saying it's always easy to talk about something you love. Right. Exactly. And it's actually, if it's in being a Freudian, it's, it is a record, yeah. right? It's a record of our time and yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, um, but thank you very much. And I hope you'll come back again and we can do uh, perhaps. Uh, I would very much enjoy carrying on more conversations about <laughs> this wonderful uh, art form that we love so much. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you for doing this. Well, thank you. Further information on Speaking Opera can be found on our website at speakingopera.com. We can also be found on Facebook on our Facebook page, Speaking Opera, and on YouTube as Speaking Opera. Also, we can be found on Instagram.